Hi, this is James from Tabletop Gaming Guild, and today we're going to take a look at Border Reavers. Now, Border Reavers has been designed by Ed Beach and it's published by GMT Games. Now, this is actually one of the nicest GMT games I have ever played. I love the component quality in this game. Now, there's still some chits in the game. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that whatsoever. I just really like the fact that it has uh, wooden horses and wooden sheep in the game and uh, the uh, overall quality of this game is really, really nice. I just want to throw that out uh, to start. And i not really that much of a history buff, but uh, anything in this area here I really want like to learn about. And one of the really cool things that came in this game, too, is also going to be a historic booklet that talks about the uh, time setting for this game. But what I'm mainly here for, because I'm not really that big of a war gamer or a solo gamer, is the game itself and how the game itself plays. Now, the rule books on this game are pretty thick uh, for both the multiplayer and the uh, solo. And what I will say is everything that's in the multiplayer rule book is pretty much in the solo rule book. So it's a lot of duplicated stuff. Also, in the in the book, six pages of it are just talking about the components. Uh, so the setup there is only like a half half a page at most so the setup of the game is super easy and the actual sequence of play is a page and then it goes through and you're going to go through three turns in the game and each turn is going to have four seasons and the seasons are broken down but they're very they're really not that complicated it just goes over in detail every little minutia in the game the overall game isn't that uh, difficult to learn and get into and really what I hope it, to do here is I'm not doing a full rules or o like a full overview of the game I'm just doing like a really brief uh, idea of how the game is laid out and played and that's it so I'm just going to go over the really really basic rules for it basically what would you get on the little player reference sheet that you get in the game just to give you a, a general idea of how the game flows itself and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to give you my final thoughts All right, so this is Border Reavers. Border Reavers, as you can see, is a massive board here with uh, two additional boards off to the side here, a big massive player board that can barely fit into the screen here, and you have stuff offloaded onto the board here for each of the families that are in the game. It also comes with three different pamphlets here uh, that are fairly thick here. It has the uh, multiplayer, it has the solo, and it has the historical booklet. Uh, historic booklet has tons of really good information on, about the history of the time there. Uh, it's really nice flavor for the uh, game itself. Uh, the solo book is just as thick and big as the uh, multiplayer rule book. I will note that the a lot of the rules are completely duplicated between the multiplayer book and the solo rule book. Uh, so you have to keep that in mind. If you know how to play the multiplayer game, you are pretty much just I need to learn a couple things for the solo rules. If you know the solo rule book, you there's only a couple more things you need to change up for the multiplayer rule book. So you can read one rule book and know 90 9% of the other rule book. I'm not going to go over the solo rules because I'm not really a solo gamer. The solo game for me was fine. Um, it was interesting in uh, a way that it helps you become better at the game. So if you love this game and you want to become better at a certain family or just, you know, better in the game in general, the solo game is pretty cool for that. Uh, it will, I'll let other people review the solo game. There's a couple uh, really good reviewers out there that did really well with the review of the solo game and even did a playthrough. I'll put the link in the description there so you can check those out and a shout out to them. Uh, but I'm just going to go over mainly the multiplayer rulebook and I'm not really going to go over the rules itself. I'm just going to give you a really quick overview of how the game plays. Even though this book is really, really thick, um, the majority of the book here, if you check it out, is just an introduction and there is multiple pages here, a lot of different pages on actual just the components, like all these pages here. That's just talking about the components in the game. The setup here is pretty easy and brief. And here is the sequence of play. Look how 
nice and concise that is. And then you can uh, spread that out into each of the summer, autumn, winter, and spring uh, parts of the game here are all described in really good detail. Uh, but the essence of the game is just right here, sequence of play, right there, that's it. And then you can get a little bit more detail on here. If you taught this, you also have some of the little more complicated things was going to be battling, but the battling here is just described on here. And basically the battling's a roll off, um, where you have your successful and unsuccessful rolls on here. And this shows you what your rolls, uh, will get you in here and, uh, defense roles for defending against it. And here uh, it goes over the sequence of play and it goes over each of the seasons here, summer, autumn, winter, and the round ends in spring. In this game, they call rounds turns. So you're going to have like six different, what I call turns in a round or what they're calling a turn. So, well, let's try to make this less confusing. You will uh, have seven cards and you'll draft them in the game. These cards, you're going to pick one and use it as your action for the, use it for your action. Everyone's going to do this simultaneously. Then you're going to draft another card. Use that one as your action. Then everyone's going to draft a card and do, use that as action down until you get six turn, six uh, card plays. And at the end of the six card plays, you're going to continue on uh, through the rest of the seasons. And at the end of the seasons, you're going to start another turn. The game goes over three turns. The first turn, at the end of first turn you score, at the end of the second turn you score, at the end of the third turn you score with the special scoring for end game. That's a whole game. So you have three turns in the game and each of those turns is broken down into four seasons. And during the summer season, you're gonna take um, up to like six actions with your cards. And we're gonna go over all that a little bit more in detail, but in a nutshell, that is the flow of the game. Let's go over the uh, flow of one, of a turn. So remember, there's three turns. You're going to have three decks for these. So this is like, this is the turn one deck. And each turn is 10 years. So this is turn one, 10 years. This is turn two, 10 years. So this is going to be 20 years worth of gameplay here. And then you have turn three, which is going to end in the 30 year time span that this goes in. Um, so let's go over what you're going to do on a turn. All right, so let's get into sequence of play. So sequence of play, like I said, is going to take over a 30 year time span and each of these is going to be der um, derived in down two turns. So you're going to have three turns over 30 years. And the first turn and the second turn and third turn is going to be broken down into the four seasons. You're going to start at summer, you're going to go into autumn, you're going to go into winter, and you're going to end with spring. In summer, you're going to take the turn deck, so in this case it's going to be turn one, and you're going to deal seven cards out to each player. Like so. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to look through these cards here and you're going to pick a card that you want for your action for the turn or for the you want as your action and you're going to pass the rest of the cards face down. When you pass these cards face down the other player is not allowed to look at this turn card yet. So what you're going to do is you're going to then play the card that you uh, selected and the cards have all different types of effects in here. So this one here uh, you can ignore these bottoms here. This is going to be for your, um, uh, if you do solo, so you don't need to pay attention to this. Uh, this one here is going to give you a bonus attack die. And in winter, add one notoriety in either uh, these locations here. So this one here is going to be related to the southern, um, so you see it's a blue color. See, it's like a blue color, which matches this blue color. So it's related to the, sorry, Scottish Middlemarch. And then here it's going to be red, which is my area that I'm playing in. And that's going to be related to the English uh, Middlemarch. Now, one thing I'm going to step back a little bit here. During setup, you're going to get a um, sheep in each of your farm areas. And you're going to get, uh, place your cube in the opposite person's goal and um, feud area. You'll also get three horses. The horses are gonna be used for combat and other things. You'll get eight cattle, which eight cattle is gonna be what you're gonna use as your currency in the game. You'll get a deputy warren and a rumor 
uh, defense tokens. Uh, you'll place your uh, person on the notoriety track here, which is a way to get points in the game. And that's going to be really quickly the setup for your area there. Uh, now everyone else will do the same. And keep in mind that there's this little area here called the debatable land. The debatable land is an area you can raid and does have a notoriety track that you can move up. And that one has two sheep available in the middle there. The debatable land is owned by no one in the notor and the um, uh, notor um, sorry the the uh, not uh, notoriety track is just for point scoring basically for that area. So what I showed you with this token here is just basically going to be a recruit token, and that's one that you can use for recruiting. Uh, the one with the arrow on it, like this one here, is an attack token. Uh, this one here is going to gain you a cow, which again is going to be your currency in the game. And this is uh, Ignore Defender's defense tokens in this raid, a feud or a goal break. These dice are not rolled, having or having or having of attack strength does not apply. If defending player's uh, warden card to respond to this attack, its effects are voided to return this card for future use. So basically, this guy right here is going to be really cool for um, using against your opponent in an attack. Uh, here's another going to be a reinforcements card here. You're going to uh, claim this warden, so you're going to get Henry uh, Percy, and these ones are going to go, that would actually go into your defense token area, and those tokens are available up here. There's only one copy of each one in here, each of them are named, and there's eight for the six player game. Uh, this one here, uh, you can flip down two of your sheep, which must be from different regions to show that they're protected by Bastilles. So Bastilles are going to protect your sheep uh, from raids and stuff, and uh, which is good. So here, uh, this one's going to give you uh, Richard of Esk. This is going to be another one of those tokens here. This one's going to get a bonus attack die for raid, feud, goal, and battle. Add one more attack die if allied with the Grams. Okay, so here's early defense. Draw one defense token at random. Most defense tokens will be drawn as random. So you either um, will... Uh, want to get a little bag to put them in. Same with the cute turn cubes. You're gonna to wanna to put a little bag for the turn cubes too. Uh, this one here is the Keep of Lindendale. This is uh, must be Scottish to play. So these ones can add and uh, improve your keeps and add keeps to the game uh, to help throughout, but you have to have the card that matches your area. Now, if you end up with a card and you, can't, and you don't wanna play it, you can actually do the default actions where the default actions are listed on here. So here's some default actions. You can add uh, one horse, add one sheep, add three cattle, add one notoriety, and Bastille one sheep. So I mean, Bastille means basically protect one sheep from raids. Uh, but you're going to continue on doing this. Pick a card, draft, then everyone plays it. Then uh, you're going to pick a card, draft, everyone plays it until you get the last two. When you get to the last two, you're going to pick one of them to play and put the other one in these held cards that you can use in the future, which is pretty cool. So really quick nutshell, that's how you're actually going to do the summer uh, season in the game. There's a little bit more to it, but basically I just wanted to give you an idea of how that resolves, and you're going to do that three times for turn one, turn two, and turn three. Um, of course, you're going to finish the other three seasons first, but you'll have three attempts to do summer. Uh, so after summer, you're going to go right into autumn. So in autumn, you're going to do an economic update. That's going to be check hand size and horses against the family capacity on their sheep on the map and their sheep on the map. Discard any extra cards or horses. If it's above the limits, then gain cattle income. So basically, you're going to look and you have these defaults on here which is going to be uh, your starting default here. So I'm going to have a horse limit of five. I'm going to have a high end size of two, and I'm going to have a cattle income of three. So I'll get my cattle income. So I'll get three more cattle income. Those are stored up here. There's going to be uh, fives and threes. So I'll get three little tokens here for my cattle income. And you can just consider cattle as money in the game basically. Then some of these cards will actually cost uh, money to put out and you'll play cattle to do so. Uh, you're going to draw event cards. You're going to uh, pick three random events for the turn. Uh, if playing, okay, so 
You're going to pick three random events. So random the events will come out, and you'll have different events here. So like this one here is, uh, see if I get this on focus here so you can see it. Okay, this is Mary Queen of Stock, Scots. Uh, you got a reroll uh, available to attack in England, uh, available to defend, not in battle in Scotland. And uh, this is the four player one down here. Uh, here's going to be uh, available to attack during raids or battles during the Scotland or debatable lands. And this one here is going to be battle uh, plus two notoriety and three victory points per hit, which is pretty cool. We'll go over battling in a second here. All right, so you select your events. You have your event discard and your target discards there for your events. And you're in place defenses. All families secretly allocate defense tokens to boxes in their march. So I can take these defense tokens here and I can uh, place them out on the board here however I want. So we'll do that. And then you go into winter. So in winter, you're going to determine order. Remember how I said you should have a bag for these cubes? Now, it does, the game doesn't come with a bag. We just create a bag and you can pull these out and that's going to determine the turn order. So, after you determine uh, turn order, you're going to select targets. All families simultaneously choose which targets they will play. So, you have these little uh, target uh, um, icons here, and you're going to place them in feuds to be able to target. Uh, place notoriety in reverse order. Families add notoriety to the marshes. No, uh, notoriety cards may also be played at this time, so you can play notoriety cards. And your notoriety can go up here, um, and that'll gain you more points at the end of the game. All right, now you're gonna select your uh, final targets here. Uh, in turn order, families choose their targets, uh, farm region, feud, goal break, move their attack indicators and horses to this map location. When you use these horses, they're gonna be able to be used in combat. After they're used, they're laid down to show that they're used if they don't get destroyed. Um, then you're going to compute combat dice. You're going to see how many combat dice each. We're going to go over combat in a minute here. Uh, you're going to resolve your combat. You're going to redo turn order. So uh, if this is uh, turn one, a second random determination of turn order is performed. Uh, so this is turn one. So you would do that. Uh, repeat for second attack. You're going to do the second attacks now. And you're going to battle, do battle awards, which is post combat awards are granted for any battle that was only contested by one side. Uh, then you're gonna go into spring. You're gonna reset and stand up all your horses, uh, reset the debatable land, uh, and uh, put it back to two sheep, uh, discard current events, uh, return defense tokens to their families, score victory points. So you're gonna go through your victory points. You're gonna add them for notoriety um, and reavers in the goal. Uh, play uh, spring cards, um, turn three only. For that, there's spring cards available there that you can play uh, for points. Record end of uh, turn total victory points and bonus actions only in turn one and two because in turn three, you're ending the game and you're doing final scoring. And with that, uh, families are awarded victory points for livestock in their possession. So you'll get victory points for that. So two things I want to go over real quick is going to now, again, this isn't going to be rules. I'm just getting a general idea of how to play the game is going to be the final scoring and going to be battles. All right, so let's go over combat first. After committing your final targets, the attacker may begin assembling the attack and defense dice needed to resolve this combat. Players are encouraged to assemble dice from all combat simultaneously to speed along play. So basically, everyone that's involved with combat, you're going to take care of that stuff and you're going to do it while everyone else simultaneously is doing the same thing. Uh, you're going to have uh, horses. Uh, you're, well, you're going to have a couple different things that are going to help with your uh, at computing your dice strength. Uh, so for attacker, you're going to have the reaver use the bottom attack uh, dice for this uh, combat type on the reaver card. If the reaver is Ralph or the third, cattle may be expended. And you can use those to up your attack, so you can get extra attack die. Horses add a die uh, per horse. Um, you can have an allied grain. 
um, bonus attack die in the marsh on the allied grain card if you have that. So basically you can get bonus points from cards, horses, your notoriety, two dice if sole possession of the first in the notoriety of this marsh. So whatever marsh you're attacking, if you're the, in first for notoriety on there, um, you will get a bonus die for that. Uh, one die for each sheep without a Bastille in the target farm region. Remember I talked about those Bastille and protecting your sheep? Well, this is one of the big reasons why you want to do that um, because you don't want them to get a uh, bonus die on that. Uh, feud cubes, uh, one die for each attacker's cube in the feud with box. So this is the feud with box right here. So um, if blue attacked me, they would get an extra die on there. Uh, goal break cubes, uh, one die uh, for each attacker's cube in the reaver ghoul box, which is so this one here. So blue attacked me, they would get an extra die. Uh, and offices, two dice if bonus from the captain, um, Berwick, or keepers of uh, Lindensdale is allocated to this attack. So you can have people attack allocated to add bonus die, and then simply for defense die, which is much easier to compute because there's very few things for that. Uh, peels, you get one die for each uh, peel adjacent to the farm. Peels are going to be uh, things that you can build to help protect your area. Uh, castles, another thing you can build to help protect your area. Uh, you get two dice for each castle. Uh, garrison adjacent to the farm region targeted by the raid. So having castles and peels is very helpful. Uh, for defense, you get uh, one die for each icon of the proper color on the defense token, green die icons in this raid, gray die if it's a feud or goal break, add one die if this uh, is a goal break occurring in walled towns, so, and battle dice. One die uh, for each die, one die for each die icon present on the battle event card. So you can get them from having your peels, your garrison, and cards for defense basically in there. And combat is resolved pretty easily. You're going to roll the dice. So the attacker is going to get a plus one on all their rolls. And there's going to be this chart right here that's going to tell you what's going to happen. Uh, now you have bonuses for if um, a seven's rolled and a bonus if a six is rolled. And I did say that backwards, so I do apologize. The defender gets a plus one on there, so defenders can roll sevens. Um, Attacker, if you roll a one or two, you miss. If you roll a three or four, you get a cattle hit, so you get to kill one of their cattle, which remember is a is money. So this is you're gonna take away that player's money in the game. If they don't have any left, you're gonna get a victory point. Um, if it's not blocked, or sorry, you get a victory point either way. Uh, if they don't block it, you're gonna get a cattle hit and a victory point. Um, if you uh, do a sheep hit. Uh, which is a five or six, you're going to get awarded two victory points if not blocked. And it doesn't matter if they run out of cattle or sheep, uh, you will still get those victory points for those rolls. Now defensive rolls on a one, two, three, or four, it's a miss. Uh, if it's a five, you're going to block. So a block nullifies the most common hit, cattle and sheep, until they are equalized. If tied, nullify a cattle hit. So Basically, you're going to be trying to block with your fives uh, the um, the attack hits for cattle and sheep. You get, if you roll a six, uh, first roll of six is a capture. Subsequent rolls of six are blocks, which isn't good because you're trying to block attacks. If a capture occurs, the attacker loses one horse and a cube from the attacker in the reaver's uh, goal box in the defending town, defender's town. So that's also very, very good because you want them to lose horses. Horses help out with combat. If you roll a seven, a seven is a hanged, uh, and all subsequent uh, sevens are capture. So capture again is going to be them losing horses. Uh, if hanged result occurs, the attacker loses one horse and the defender gains six victory points, which is really, really good. All right, so. That basically is your roll off for attacking or uh, for a combat. Uh, post combat awards uh, for each unblocked cattle hit, the attacker gains one of the uh, cattle in the defender's cattle box, uh, which is money. If more cattle hits remain after, they're still going to get their victory points. Uh, for the sheep, uh, the attacker gains one sheep for each unblocked sheep hit. 
uh, they will also get their points. And if there isn't any points available, or sheep available, they still get their points. Uh, feud cubes, if the attacker gained at least one victory point attack, the defender has gained a new feud with the attacking family. Add one of the defending defender's cube to the feud box in the attacking family's marsh. All right, so the other thing that can happen for combat is going to be feud. If you do a feud, uh, the attacks are pretty simple. If you roll one, two, three, or four, it's a miss. If you roll a five or six, it's a hit with a three point victory, if not blocked. Uh, defense is a one, two, three, four, is a miss. A five is a block. A block nullifies the attacker's hit, obviously. A six, the first roll of a six is a hit and rewards three victory points. Um, and, and this is in defense, by the way. And the attacker loses one horse. Subsequent sixes are blocks. A seven, hit three victory points, and the attacker loses one horse. That is really all there is to combat. The post-combat awards, whichever side scored the most hits, gains two naira, na, uh, notoriety, notoriety in the marsh. Um, the losing side drops by one no notoriety in that marsh. If both sides scored the same number of hits, no notoriety change occurs. All right, and the last thing to go over is going to be the end game scoring. So you're going to gain three victory points for every two horses you have, two victory points for every two sheep that you have, and you're going to gain one victory point for every two cattle. So cattle, which is the money in the game. All right, once the livestock scores have been determined, compute the final score for each family and record it in the Border Reavers score sheet, which is on the back of this book, and you make photocopies of it. Or you can download the PDF and print that out. Uh, if there's a tie of the first uh, place, use the tie-breaking procedures listed below. So for tie-breaking, uh, if families are ever found to be in a tie, uh, break ties by reviewing the items below it, until no tie is uh, tie is no longer present. Horses, the family with the most horses wins. The family with the most sheep wins. The family with the most cattle win. And for recruit summer cards, the family with the highest number summer card on their family sheet is going to win. And that's it. There's also going to be advanced rules in the game. Uh, you can use these trait cards in the uh, advanced rules that uh, make it really good. I would suggest never using these until you've played at least one or two games of this. Like I said, there's also going to be the solo um, game for this. And uh, that is it. That's going to be a really quick overview of how to play Border Reavers. This really, well, to take it back, this isn't actually going to be valid enough to teach you how to play. This is just giving you a general idea of how the game is um, played. So the different rounds that you have, the fact that you score after each turn, a turn is going to consist of uh, four seasons and the game lasts till the third turn and you do score uh, points at the end of every turn and this the third turn you also do end game scoring so the things you're trying to gain throughout the game is you're trying to gain more notoriety get more points you're going to go up this track as you gain those points you're also trying to collect your horses and sheep uh, for points at the end of the game and uh, potentially cattle. They're not worth a whole bunch, but they are your currency, so they're very important for that, and you can lose them in the game too, so it's more of a spend them when you can sort of thing for the, the cattle. Uh, lots of really cool um, combat and decisions in this game, but overall, I hope that helped you give an idea of what this game is. Let's go head back up to the table here, and I'll give you my final thoughts on Border Reavers. All right, so I don't play a ton of war games and I definitely don't play very many solo games. The solo mode on this game is fun, even though I didn't go over it, but it's pretty much, I think, shines. Again, I am not a solo player. It shines with other players and it shines at the highest play counts for this game. In this case, six players. I think this game is best with high play counts. You get that nice player interaction. You get the, the players who actually are thinking of different strategies and they're reacting to yours in a more organic way of your decisions and what you do in the game. So I do appreciate that a lot. And I think that's where this game shines, like I said. But again, not a solo player. So you probably want to check out 
uh, other reviewers that do solo reviews primarily for if you are a solar gamer for uh, their opinions on that over mine because I don't think mine is going to be as educated because like I said I'm not really a solo player but multiplayer experience and this is coming from someone that plays like mainly modern uh, board games not that this is a modern but this is a war game so I don't play a lot of war games but this actually feels like a lot of the games that I love it's very mechanically straightforward I like all the different options you get. I really, really love that drafting. That drafting of actions is amazing. That is an amazing addition to this game. I think that is really great. I've played a lot of other GMT games in the past. None of them really have had that. And I think this game has really learned maybe from some of the modern board games. Again, not saying that other war games are... Um, <clears throat> A problem and all. I'm just saying that this game here feels like like some of the other games that I play, like Blood Rage and games of that, instead of just like a pure war game. So I'm more at home with this board game because it does feel like games that I'm used to, instead of the large chip based battle games, which I have a harder time learning because I'm not very used to those games. This, I didn't have the problem of that at all. It was pretty intuitive, pretty straightforward, felt like a normal dudes on the map style game with a lot of really good strategic choices throughout the game. So I really love this. This game here, I will play anytime anyone asks me to. I will definitely do the teach on the game anytime anyone asks me to, uh, which I think to actually teach the game, which I didn't do during uh, that little, uh, sort of really brief overview. I think the teach on the game would probably take about 15, 20 minutes uh, because I think the teach is going, I'm gonna to need to go over some of the nuancey things in the game so there's no gotchas in it because uh, some of those cards are pretty powerful in this game and there's uh, some really cool uh, things that you can do uh, to react to your opponents or uh, when you're attacking. Uh, other opponents. So there's a lot of things to, I want to just like highlight on that for them. But after that, I think that uh, people will pick on up on this game pretty quickly. So I do agree with their uh, assessment on BGG. This is like a two, 2.5 weight game. That's about right. It's not a lightweight game. It's a moderate game. It's not a heavy game by any means at all. I don't think, uh, I think that uh, an, a gamer could pick this up. Uh, like I said, uh, if you're looking for a uh, traditional uh, GMT war style game, I'm not sure that this would 100% fall on this, but this does have, I think, a lot of really cool elements in it that make it a lot of fun to play. Uh, everything seems to be balanced pretty well in the entire game, so you could play any of the different families and it, you have a good chance of winning. I mean, overall, I love this game. So I'm fumbling all over a lot of stuff. GMT puts out a lot of solid products and this is one of them. And like I said, I just wanted to say that if you want to get into wargaming and you're more used to playing the games like Blood Rage, NS, or other like Cthulhu, Death Bay Die, or any of those type of games, and you're more into those, but you would love to get into wargaming, this is the game I think that you should play. I think that this would be the greatest GMT game to get an introduction to war games. And I bet you, uh, if you like history and you're a history buff and you want to uh, experience more of the different uh, simulations on uh, different time periods and different conflicts throughout history, this is the one that's going to get you into that. And then you can jump into all the other GMT games for whatever topic uh, float your boat or you like to learn the most about. So that's my thoughts on Border Reavers. Thank you for watching.